QCon New York conference. We're going to have interviews with um, Gil Tenna, who's with me today from Azul Systems. Um, Trisha Gee and Baruch will be joining us shortly as well for additional interviews, but let's, let's focus on Gil, who's actually here today. And you're giving a talk earlier today on something about transactional memory, yep. something. Hardware transactional memory. Hardware transactional memory. Very cool. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, so what, what, was the, what was the takeaway from that talk? Uh, for me or for the audience? <laughs> 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 yeah. Let's start with the takeaway from you. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, it was a nice full back room, and it was nice and packed. And then they moved the next session to an even bigger room, because I think our Java track started in too small room. That's yeah, th that, that yeah. was... Hopefully that was Peter there will get the bigger room. P Peter's going to yeah. get the benefit <laughs> of the fact that there's way too many Java folks for them to stick you guys in the small room. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, very um, good. But yeah, I think it's, it's, a it's a pretty exciting subject because it's something that is actually new and actually is now available to everyone. Um, uh, hardware transactional memory was sort of a cool academic thing and something that was available in all kinds of exotic pieces of hardware, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the real news is that as of late March, uh, it's a feature that's there on every Intel server that you can buy today. Okay. Uh, so as of now, and it wasn't there before, so, so all new so servers so now shipping now. Most people this. deploying to modern chip architectures are going to have the advantage of hardware transactional exactly. memory if they choose to optimize for it. Uh, if the things they run on have chosen to optimize for it. Yeah. So the nice, cool thing, and some of what I talked about is the ability of um, things like the runtimes or the libraries to transparently optimize existing codes to use the feature. And we're going to see how effective or not that is for the real world in the coming couple of years, probably, because I mean, servers, any server you buy today, new, is going to have this feature. Uh, but it'll take a little while until enough servers have it to for us to see the experience. Um, okay, so for the for the uninitiated, give the quick like one minute pitch on what hardware transactional memory is and why should you care about it. So hardware transactional memory basically is a hardware based trick that allows um, software to speculate into locked code concurrently. So you could take code that was built to grab a lock, do something critical, let go of the lock, and mm -hmm. serialize in a critical section and run multiple separate CPUs in the same critical section at the same time safely. Uh, in a way that um, if they complete safely, they all made it through, and if they didn't complete safely because they somehow collided on data in a way that was actually yeah. critical, then they actually the hardware can back out the transaction, and as far as the software is concerned, it never happened, nobody okay. saw it. So it's kind of an uh, optimistic assumption. Precisely. It's kind of like optimistic uh, optimistic concurrency in transactions and databases yeah. applied to locking in hardware without okay. changing the meaning of a lock to software. Got so it. a Java so synchronized block becomes um, something that can you can run the same Java synchronized block on the same monitor in 100 threads at the same time. And as, as long, long as they don't collide on the memory, then yeah. you have no performance degradation. Exactly. As long as they don't collide in the memory in a conflicting fashion. Yeah. So exactly. in a way that is. So for example, if two things read the memory, that's, that's not a conflicting fine. collision. If one guy writes here and another guy reads there, not conflicting. But if they both read and write to the read same, and write the same location, location, that's a conflict and you have to back up. Uh, and the hardware can detect that, automatically back it out. And it's when used the right way from the software layers, like a runtime or a POSIX library, um, your regular locking semantics, synchronized yeah. blocks and locks in Java, POSIX mutexes, can just become optimistic locking as part of pessimistic locking. Okay, and what supports hardware transactional memory today? Um, so, it, putting aside what I call the exotic implementations, actually yeah. Azul shipped Vega machines with hardware transactional memory back in 2004. So 12 okay. years ago. So you guys have been doing um, this for quite a while. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of experience <laughs> in it, but since we moved from hardware to pure software in x86, we've been waiting for the feature. Yeah. And it's finally here. Yeah. We have software that is ready to go to use it because we had hardware that uses it. Um, but if you look at it today, and let's put aside the Vega and Power and Spark implementations that have various exotic uses, um, commodity-wise, 
Intel server chips. So the it basically anything with a V4 at the end or mm -hmm. higher, V4 or V5 has the feature. It's called a Broadwell or Skylake have it. Okay. Um, so the Intel E3 V4 and V5 chips, the Intel E5 V4 chips that came out in March, and the Intel E7 V3 and above all have the feature baked in. It's really these E5 V4s, and I know I'm using codes, but those are the chips that all the two socket servers in the world are built out of, or most of. This is what Amazon uses to build everything. This is what your typical data center software will run on. Yeah. Um, as of late March, all the new ones have the features. So if you're running a new server, it's there. And it's just up to the software to make use of it. Okay, um, that's which cool. Is really so cool. it, sounds like it sounds like that's just the server class CPUs for those chipsets, yep. not the you know, desktop or enthusiast class um, CPUs. So the feature technically exists, uh, I believe, even in lower end, like four core systems. Yeah. But it's questionable how much it matters there. Since the benefit is allowing more cores to execute code at the same time, mm -hmm. the benefit only really kicks in when you have a lot of cores. So if you have a two core, four core it system. It doesn't really matter. I mean, yeah, so you could get a little bit more concurrency. When you have a two socket system with a total of 80 hardware threads, not having them serialized on lock has a much more dramatic impact on scale. Yeah, yeah, no, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. It's also, I think, why we don't yet know what the behavior will really be for real applications, because hardware that had the feature has been around for experimentation for a couple years now mm -hmm. um, at the low end, but actual servers with lots of hardware threads and the feature available commodity-wise for everybody to run on, that's new. That's like two months old right now. Yeah. So and I think... Um, so, so do you have any of those big, massive, multi-core systems that you're testing on at Azul? Um, well, they're not big, massive. They're small, low-end right. commodity servers. Small like, yeah. commodity. <laughs> well, a two-socket server yeah. with, with... That's, you know, right now, commodity level is somewhere in the order of 40 hardware threads per machine. That's an entry-level server. Okay. So yeah, and we test in those certainly. Um, you could go to Amazon and use just what sort of performance performance difference do you see in your testing? Um, uh, well, that's the hard thing. Um, <laughs> we have micro benchmarks where you get a hundred to one improvement. Um, okay. Yeah. Because they're built to demonstrate a feature, right? Yeah. Uh, we have micro benchmarks that do nothing good. Because uh, they're they're because built to show that failure yeah. cases where exactly. it collides. Exactly. There is actual contention you can't get away yeah. from. Um, and everything in between. The real question is, what's the mix of between those two in the real world? Yeah. And we don't have experience on x86 yet because the feedback loop with new hardware isn't closed yet. Um, but I could say that based on our experience with Vega 10 years ago, uh, what we found is that some applications gain tremendously. Tremendously would be uh, anywhere from 50% better to a 3x better throughput. Okay. Um, and some applications gained absolutely nothing. More applications did not gain than ones that did. Um, the ratio is probably 10 to 1 around that. Yeah, yeah. I guess it, it also depends where break. your performance bottleneck is in the application as well. I mean, yep. if, you're, if you're locking an external resource, like a database or something else, it's not going to... Yeah, or if you're doing I.O. or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, the the interesting thing, or the hard thing to get right, was to get it so that it can only help and it can never hurt. Yeah. Um, and that's the tricky thing. If it sometimes helps and sometimes hurts, you don't know if to turn it on. Or the nice thing is to make it adaptive so it measures whether or not it helps, which is possible. Okay. And, and then, then the kind feature of is turns it on yeah. or off based on how exactly. much it's actually. And we actually turn it on and off based individually on each monitor. So not the piece of code. The same code could be running on a hundred different objects that are monitored, and one of those objects may be good to speculate on, while another won't. And the JVM actually learns and adapts on a per-object basis. Yeah, on that's interesting. So in runtime, it's actually keeping track of how it's affecting performance, and then adapting yeah. it per monitor. Exactly. If there's no contention at all, it doesn't use it. If there is contention, it figures whether or not using it wins or loses for that object. And then based on those stats, it'll decide whether to keep speculating. Okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, I think that was a good cover of hardware transactional memory. It yeah. sounds like folks can try today on existing commodity hardware using the Azul JVM.
Yep. And it's it's worth mentioning that Zing in the Azul JVM supports it. Hotspot also supports it uh, in a slightly different implementation, but uh, since I think 8 update 40 or 60. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a matter of getting a JVM, ours or Hotspot, on the right piece of hardware. Got it. Uh, and taking it for a spin. Yep, and hopefully people will give it a try and um, see how it affects their applications and then give feedback to, to Gil so he has an idea how it's actually working in industry. Yep, absolutely. All right, so thanks a lot for the Thank lunchtime you. interview here yep. at the QCon New York conference. Um, for those of you on the live stream, um, stay tuned for more interviews. Trisha will be coming up for an interview, and Farouk will also be joining us in a few minutes. You can watch all of the live recordings and streams at nighthacking.com. So thank you very much.